This is kind of the third of a set. We had uh, Fader talking yesterday about uh, how to do atomic, especially one on older compilers, which uh, is an impressive uh, feat these days. We had uh, Michael talking about uh, the atomics in general, the various memory orders, and so I'm coming, uh, drilling down into the bottom of the depths with memory order consume, uh, which has been uh, a sort of a sad story. Uh, there's a few people that have been involved with it through its whole life, but uh, maybe we're coming in sight of a happy ending. But uh, let's see what we got here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why you would want to use it, the target workloads, and why we'd have it, uh, what the problems are with the current definition of the standard, and some of you who are compiler writers may know, understand this uh, better than I do, or feel it more sharply anyway. Uh, we'll talk about some proposed resolutions. Over the past year and a half, there's been a number of them put forward, and it looks like we've got something that might be reasonable for two different use cases. And if we have time, um, I mean, we've done double-check locking the other two, so I guess I got to double-check locking as well and show how you do it with memory order consume. Why not? If we have time, we'll get there. Target workloads. So you'd use memory order consume for linked data structures. Um, it's used, basically what it's doing is imposing order when you're following pointers, relying on the fact the hardware does that for you in almost all cases, deck alpha being the exception that proves the rule. And if you're using this, um, there's other things you could do. Um, let's face it, if you don't care about performance, why don't you just write a single-threaded program, get on with your life? In fact, why not use a scripting language and make it so you don't have to mess with compilers and all this stuff, right? So if you're doing this, performance has to be something you care deeply about, and it has to be a performance level you can't get with a sequential processor, just a single CPU. And uh, this is not tongue-in-cheek. Uh, there's a number of cases where you do optimization on sequential code that will get you orders of magnitude. In contrast, if you're adding parallel processors, uh, it's possible but hard to get a greater speed up than the number of processors you add. Okay? So again, if your performance has been handled single-threaded, do it single-threaded, ignore this. Uh, at the same time, performance can't be the only concern. If all you care about is performance, if you want performance at any cost, no matter what, my friend, you're writing hand-coded assembly. You're not doing this. You're not using C, you're not using C++. Okay? So we're kind of in the sweet spot where we care about performance, we need parallelism, we need the scalability, but we're willing to give up a little bit to let the compiler help us out and to uh, deal with that sort of thing. So although, quite frankly, uh, it's quite possible that compilers are better at generating code than people are today. But still, if you're going for that last little bit, you're down on the metal. So in short, we want to maximize performance, but we want to maintain all the other nice things, you know, portability, maintainability, reasonable levels of productivity. And uh, what we do here to get this to work, you know, there's an old saying that I disagree with, actually, that says that weak memory requires strong minds. And... Well, not really. What it requires is good APIs. If you have good APIs, you can get the benefits, the performance benefits of the weak memory. And remember, weak memory isn't just the CPU, it's also the compiler doing things to you, for you, against you, something. Uh, and those APIs allow that to happen, allow you to gain that performance without having to twist your mind around exactly all the orderings that are going together. And that's, that's the goal here. So why memory order consume specifically? I mean, parallelism, there's a lot of ways to achieve it. Uh, this is just one for a specific case, so let's look at what we're doing here. So we've got to have a diagram with arrows and uh, orders and dependencies. And I've left out the sequence befores that Michael had earlier. And so we've got two threads. The top three statements are the first thread. And running in parallel is this other thread down here with the bottom three statements. And, of course, there's sequence befores between each pair of statements there. Now, um, what we're doing is we do a relax store to x, some unrelated variable. We then do a relax store to an element within a structure pointed to by p, the pointer p. And after that, we do a memory order release store of p, a local variable, into some global. Okay? So we've taken and we've initialized some unrelated variable we filled out an element and a structure we're playing with, and then we're taking a pointer to that structure and publishing it into this variable GP. That's what one thread is doing. 
Because we do a release there, we have some notion of ordering between that last store and the previous two stores. All right. However, as Fader pointed out, um, in the Linux kernel we call it memory barrier pairing, but however you call it, you don't get ordering just by ordering one thread. You have to have ordering in both threads. If you let either thread do things out of order, you haven't got ordering. They have to both work together. And so we have to look at what's happening in the reading thread down here on the last three lines. Now what it does is it loads that GP thing, that global pointer, that points to that structure we filled out with its single field A there. And if we happen to get that pointer, we have a dependency ordered before relationship between the last statement in the first thread and the first statement in the second thread. So there's that diagonal green arrow represents that. All right. And the nice thing about this is memory order consume, if we had an efficient memory order consume, which we do not yet, by the way, that's one of the things we're looking at here. Uh, if you have an inefficient one, it promotes it to acquire, and, well, life's hard sometimes. But, um, and so in Linux kernel, we still use volatile cast and various other strange non-portable tricks to get the effect. But what happens is that the second load is loading a field pointed by Q. Q is the local variable we, we load it into. And because those are dependent, we had to use the loaded value into Q to find the address for the field Q arrow A. Therefore, there's a dependency between these two statements. And that means that they have a dependency carried between those two statements. As a result, because we have our sync with four up there between the store to, to field A up there, this middle statement in the first thread, and the store into the GP pointer, we have a continuous ordering and we have a carrying dependency from that initialization of field A all the way down to the use. So we're guaranteed when we pick this up, we're gonna get the value we stored up there, the one, we're not gonna get pre-initialized garbage. If all we did was relax loads here, we could get pre-initialized garbage because, again, we have to have uh, ordering in both threads in order to see the ordering overall. Um, this, we load from GP into Q, and then we have a Q again here. Or am I missing the question? Yeah, um, yeah, I don't know. I was trying to be more clear. Perhaps I was more confusing, but life's like that. What's that? Oh, okay, you're right. That's, that is wrong. That should be going away. Thank you. Okay. Um, however, for X, there's no dependency. We load Q, it has nothing whatsoever to do with X. There is no dependency between those two statements. There is no ordering between those two statements. We have ordering in the first thread, not in the second thread, and therefore this can pick up whatever from X. It can pick up something before that initialization at the very top of the slide. So memory order consume is nice in that this can just be a normal load on almost all architectures. So very simple instruction, very fast, no artificial slowdown, but there's a penalty, there's no free lunch. If you're gonna get the ordering, you have to have dependencies between that initial load and the loads or stores that follow it. Now it turns out that if you have a linked data structure, that happens very naturally. You go down some pointer, and then you do dependent loads off of that pointer. So those dependencies happen very naturally in linked data structures. And so in linked data structures, this technique works very well. So we have to pay a little bit of a penalty when we're updating. We have to have that memory barrier or something to make that release work. On the reader side, we just issue normal instructions and things work nicely for us. With the exception, again, of deck alpha, but that's been discontinued for a while and uh, we take care of that otherwise. So this is kind of the use case, is to be able to do linked operations, linked data structures, especially read intensive ones, using very simple, very cheap instructions and getting very high performance as a result. Well, okay, that's great. Uh, the reader went really fast, but so what? They've got updaters too, right? That's true, you do. The reason this has become important compared to, say, 25 years ago when I was first starting to do parallel programming is that the machines have gotten a lot bigger and more complex, and they adapt themselves to their environment. If I plug a memory stick, well, you saw, I plugged a video in this machine and the slide projector came on. If I plug a memory stick into it, 
it would pop up and say, oh, you got a memory stick. If I were to try to do that, say, in the early 80s, I'd have to recompile the kernel to tell it about the new device because there wasn't enough freaking memory to represent the possibility there might be a device or might not. You had to actually tell it, I've got these devices right now. And if you were to boot it on a system that didn't have those devices, it would probably panic at boot. What that means is inside this laptop, there are data structures that represent the hardware connected to it. The fact that it's got, doesn't have right now any memory keys, but it did a little while ago when I saved the, my presentation just in case. And so those structures almost never change. I plug hardware into it occasionally, but very occasionally compared to how much I'm using it. But I could plug hardware in at any time. And that means that I have things where I'm reading almost all the time. They almost never change, but they might. And so this read mostly approach, this focus on readers has become increasingly important as our hardware and software and operating systems and applications have become more able to adapt to a changing environment. So that's why it's getting more important now than it would have been, say, in the 1980s. Of course, you still need updates. And uh, oddly enough, you can use memory order consume for updates, and some people do. You can think of it as a poor man's garbage collector. So the tricks that uh, Fedor pointed out could work with a garbage collector. You can use RCU for those as well. And that does happen. People do use those in the Linux kernel for that reason. OK, um, but you know we're talking about really small changes here, right? We're talking on, on PowerPC, you get rid of an LWSync, or maybe an iSync. These are just in little instructions. On ARM, you might get rid of a DSB by doing, doing this, or a DMB, excuse me. On x86, you're constraining the compiler, not allowing you to do certain optimizations. So who cares? Why would anybody care? Well, a few months ago, I received this patch, or a, a, a predecessor of it. The initial patch I received was um, technically correct, but uh, gave false positives when various tools ran on it. Okay? So this is the modified version. And don't worry about exactly what that is. It's a bunch of weird kernel code. Uh, but uh, the key point is that it saves one store and one load. Both the store and the load are non-atomic. Uh, they have to be because this is pre-C11 and we don't have atomics, okay? To the stack, not to a shared variable. Uh, I initially suggested to the submitter that there wasn't any point in this patch. Um, and uh, uh, actually, he, uh, it was, he, he, surprisingly enough, this is visible at user mode. This is a patch deep in the kernel, and the performance difference is visible at user mode with certain benchmarks. Um, so it's uh, not as insignificant as you think. And this is, these are two normal instructions. These are not memory barriers, not locked instructions, not atomics, not nothing, all right? And the thing is, is that uh, some people do care about performance, and the Linux kernel is one of many projects that needs to accommodate their needs. All right, um, so developers who face severe performance uh, requirements, they're not going to thank you if you go throwing extra memory fence instructions in their code. Uh, they, they won't appreciate that much. And they aren't going to thank you about extra cache misses either, or extra atomic instructions. And uh, they're also not going to thank you for unnecessarily suppressing compiler optimizations. Um, uh, they've told me that uh, rather directly several times over the past decade or so. Um, you don't take my word for it if you don't want to, but uh, you know, look at LKML if you want. In some cases, LKML is insufficient to vent their ire, so they call me on the telephone and scream at me. So. Anyway, what, if C and C++ are going to continue supporting low-level development, and I believe they need to, I mean, C++ C and C++ must serve a lot of different needs. Don't get me wrong. It's not only about low-level development, but low-level development of synchronization primitives is one of the things we need to be able to do in these languages. We need to support this kind of extreme performance and scalability. And that's why we have memory order consume, or one reason. Um, it's intended to compile, as I said, on a single load on most CPUs with no ad added cruft. And as a result, it is quite fast. 
Of course, uh, uh, one question is how the heck can you use this thing? And uh, as uh, Fader pointed out, it's uh, one thing to write concurrent code. It's another thing to write correct concurrent code. And uh, we'll take a quick look at that. There's a, a guy I used to work with back in the early 90s. Um, older guy at the time, big bushy beard, you know, long white hair. Didn't have a wand, sorry. He had a, he had a sign on his cube, though. And that sign said, only those who have gone too far can possibly tell you how far you can go. <laughs> so let's go all the way here, all right? I mean, let's see what happens. So we're going to define some primitives here. RC read lock, think of that kind of like a read or write lock acquiring acquisition, sort of, kind of, but not quite. And read, RC read unlock, and I, I do mean that. Pound sign define, RC read lock, parent, parent, new line. That's the primitive. And I really do mean pound side define, RC read lock, parent, parent, new line. And uh, there's this RC do reference thing, it's just a memory order consume. If you look in the Linux kernel, you'll see some volatile casts and stuff like that, because that's what we have right now to use that with. We're kind of in the same position Fedor is. It's, we have to support compilers that are pre C11. Um, we're going to do a, a sign pointer, which is a release store, as you, and you might guess those two from that diagram with the two threads I showed a few slides back. Now, until somebody tells me otherwise, I'm going to assert that if you can use those four primitives, they're going to give you the best possible read side performance, scalability, real time response, weight freedom, and energy efficiency, at least if you had a good consume, which we don't yet. Now, yeah, I'm an old guy. You guys are young, so you guys might be up to a challenge to beat that. Um, for the first three of them, you're going to need, uh, especially the first two, you're going to need some negative. Uh, overhead, uh, which could be a challenge. Uh, but if you do that, it's really cool, and I'd like you to tell me how you do it, all right? Uh, of course, uh, some of you may be objecting at this point, wait a minute, these things aren't affecting machine state. Um, how are you synchronizing anything with them? That's a good question. It's a reasonable question. And, and by the way, I'm going to go through this really quickly. Um, there'll be some references in the slide set. I'm happy to talk to people later on. I'll be here through mid-Friday. Uh, but this is just to give you a flavor of it, you know, uh, and those of you who have some familiarity with it may uh, gain some more as well. All right, so we're talking about linked data structures. One of the things we do with linked data structures is insert new elements into the linked data structure. So let's take a really, really simple linked data structure that has just a pointer, all right? So it either has a pointer that's null or it has a pointer with one thing hanging off of it. And let's start simple and we can go from there, all right? So we have four different states here as we're inserting this element. So we start off with a null pointer, and we have colors. Um, so red means that a reader can look at any time. Now remember, RC read lock doesn't do anything. I mean, not only is it not generating instructions, the compiler backend doesn't even see it, right? The C processor gets rid of it. So we can't do anything to stop readers. They're come blasting through and check that pointer no matter what. We can't even tell they're there. So we color that red because it's kind of dangerous. If we do updates, we've got to be careful of that variable because readers can come in at any old time they want to and access it. Green stuff is stuff where we have the only reference to it. And so as long as your memory allocator is sane and people aren't using too many wild pointers, you can do whatever you want to it without worrying about interference or without worrying about interfering with somebody else. Uh, yellow we'll get to on the next slide. So the first thing we do is we do allocate a structure. And so in the second state here, we've got our structure. Uh, the pointer doesn't point to it, thankfully, because it's got garbage in it, because it has been initialized. We got our little local pointer P to it. So we initialize it. Now it's got definite fields, they got values, um, but we still can't get to it from the outside. And then we use this RCO assigned pointer, which is, turns into a consume, excuse me, a release store. And uh, I didn't want to try to type a full release store into that arrow, which is why I'm using the Linux kernel. API rather than C11s. And once we do that, suddenly the readers can get to it. This does the release so that a reader getting to it, because it's using a consume load, which is what RCUD reference does, those two orderings pair, and therefore the readers see valid data rather than the pre-initialized cruft over here that they would get if we didn't have ordering. 
But because we can use the equivalent of a consume load, they're just doing the normal load of that pointer. I mean, they take a cache miss the first time they load it because we just stored the pointer. But after that, full speed, replicating everybody's cache very fast. So what this means is we can safely insert data into a linked data structure, even though readers are plowing through that data structure at all times. So for insertion, we don't need to exclude readers. We don't need the readers to pay the overhead of checking whether there's a writer. They can just go blasting through, pick their stuff up, and get some valid data. So the key point is that RCU assigned pointer and RCU dereference avoid load and stored tearing. That means that the RCU dereference is either going to get the old null value for the pointer, or it's going to get a valued pointer to real data. It's not going to get some bitwise mashup of the two pointers. So either way, the reader's going to see something valid. Of course, if all we can do is add, um, well, we either have a garbage collector or we've got a big memory leak. And there actually are garbage collectors. Uh, I w if we tried a couple times to standardize them, we always had problems. But they're kind of out there if you want to use them. Um, otherwise, we need some way to remove something from the structure. And that's where we get to this diagram here. And this can be thought of, uh, I'll thank Mike for this one, uh, Schrodinger's cat meets Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. We're going to up the ante a little bit here. Instead of just having a single pointer with a single element, we're going to use a linked list, all right? Try to get with the times. And this is animals. We've got a boa, cat, and a canoe. They're all red because it's all hooked up there. Readers can see, be at any of those elements at any time for any length of time. We can't stop them. We can't even tell they're there. But if we were to do a list LRCU, and uh, that's just a macro inside the Linux kernel, but the essential point is that we're going to take and store into the BOA's next pointer, a pointer to the GNU, using an atomic store. So again, we're going to either see the a reader's needs the old value of the cat or the new value pointing to the GNU, but it's not going to see some smoosh of the two pointers. Either way, whether a reader goes here or here, it's going to see a valid linked list with real data in them and won't be confused. Now, the cat is yellow because um, there might be readers there. There could be readers there for any length of time, but new readers can't get to the cat anymore. We only have to worry about the old readers. Any new reader tries to get to it, it'll end up with a canoe instead. Isn't tight. Now, if we had some magic operation that waited for all the old readers, Remember, we don't have to wait for the new readers. They bypass the cat. So if we have some way of waiting for all the old readers, all the readers that already exist, when we got done waiting, there wouldn't be any readers looking at the cat anymore. Any new reader, again, bypasses the cat. So we only had to wait for the old readers. Once all the old readers are waited for, nobody's looking at the cat except us. At that point, we can just free it and be back down to two elements in the linked list. Of course, um, it'd be easier to do this if the readers were actually putting something in memory saying they were there, which they aren't. Nevertheless, it's possible to solve this problem. Um, in this case, and this is actually close to how things are implemented in one form of RCU in the Linux kernel. Um, it's uh, quiescent based, so don't worry about the QSBR for the moment. Anyway, if you build a server class Linux kernel, in other words, config preempt equals n for those that have built kernels, you end up with this type of approach. And the trick here is that RCU readers in that environment are not permitted to block. And that's the same rule you have for pure spin locks. We had some discussion about spin locks yesterday. And uh, one of the key, key questions that came up was, wait a minute, if you've got the spin lock and you're blocked and it's pure spin lock, that's going to cause a problem. And you're right, it is. That's why, in the Linux kernel, when you uphold a pure spin lock, you are not allowed to block. Every period, end of story, forget it. Because if you do, you could have all the CPUs now spinning waiting for the lock you hold. They're not going to give up their CPU until they get the lock. You're not going to give up the lock to get a CPU and you have deadlock. Therefore, if you're holding a pure spin lock in the Linux kernel, you do not block, period. If you try it, you'll get a nasty splat. Scheduling well atomic, I think it is. 
we have the same rule for RC readers. Once you've done RC read lock, you are not allowed to block until you do the matching RC read unlock. Now, there are other forms of RCU, for example, in user space, we have other tricks we use, but in the kernel, for server class builds, that's the rule. Well, what that means is that if, uh, if we have, uh, so we got the CPU2 remove the cat, and then he does synchronize RC, which means he, he blocks, right? Because synchronized RC waits until the readers are done. That means that was a context switch. Well, if you have a context switch, you can't be in a reader because readers aren't allowed to block. So as soon as this guy context switches, we know that all the previous readers have to be done. Kind of a double bank shot synchronization, if you want to think of it that way. And then uh, later on, CPU zero, he does this big long reader up here, RC read lock, a bunch of stuff, RC read unlock, and then he blocks. The same reasoning, he just blocked. He's not allowed to block inside while he's an RC reader. Therefore, all previous RC readers on CPU zero have to be done. And we apply the same reasoning to CPU one right here. At this point, all three CPUs have blocked. Therefore, we know all the readers in the system that were in, in existence, before we remove the cat, are done. The only readers left are ones that can't possibly get to the cat. And therefore, at this point, it is safe to free the cat. Anyway, again, this is, um, I have a guest lecture, I go through this like one to two hours where I go through violently this in detail, but that's the Cliff Notes version of how you can make this work, how you can remove data from a link structure even though the readers are plowing through that structure at all times, any way they want, while you're doing it. All right. So let's go back to the question we had earlier. How the heck do you synchronize when your synchronization mechanism doesn't affect machine state? And the thing is, they don't have to affect machine state. What they infect instead is the developer. Because the developer is not allowed to block between the time it did that RC read lock and it did the RC read unlock. All right, so we have synchronization affecting the developer, not the system. What this means, RCU is therefore synchronization via social engineering. <laughs> Has been for over 20 years. Thing is though, you know, every other synchronization mechanism, every other one, has a social engineering component. You've, got, you've heard both Fader and Michael say, you know, no data races, don't do that. Well, that's on the developer. That's the social engineering component of making this work. Uh, if you're doing locking, you see things like, look, just don't mess with this variable, look at it anyway, unless you're holding a lock. That's the, that's the social engineering part. There's also a mechanical part in the lock, and also in the atomics for the data races, and also the same thing for transactional memory. The weird thing about RCU isn't that it involves social engineering, it's that some implementations of it only have social engineering. But by doing that, we can use these very, very lightweight instructions. And in fact, for RC read lock and RC read unlock, no instructions whatsoever, in order to get real synchronization work done. And of course, if you're not in the kernel with a, with a uh, server class build, then I'm sorry, RC read lock and RC read unlock do have a little bit of code. It's very local, but there's some there. Um, has to because you're in a different environment. And the same for user space code. Although there is a variant of user space RCU that also has a zero cost RC read lock and RC read unlock. Uh, those are interested. Um, there's some references in the back of the slide set. So why are we doing this? Well, this is a uh, Nihala machine. And uh, we've got different operations down here on the rows. Uh, compare and swap is a compare exchange instruction. You have locks, cache misses. And uh, the, the top uh, five rows there are all within the same core. Different threads in the same core, hyper-threaded system. And you notice when you go off core, things get expensive. So we're talking almost two orders of magnitude more expensive than a, the clock period. Okay, so if you just take a cache miss, normal instruction but takes a cache miss, you're talking almost two orders of magnitude more expensive than a simple register register instruction. Communication is expensive. And if you go off socket, <laughs> way over two orders of magnitude. Really expensive. You know, it's kind of like doctor, it hurts when I do this. Don't do that. 
That's why we want to be up to the top there, and that's where RCU tries to be for the readers. And the problem we have with uh, some synchronization mechanisms, they're down here a lot. And you do need to do updates, which generally mean being down here, but you know, be careful, be smart about it. If you're going to do heavyweight synchronization, get your money's worth out of it, is what it comes down to. So let's look at what this is in the hardware structure, why this would happen. And so the, the speed of light and the atomic nature of matter that Michael managed, mentioned before, yep, this right here, this is the diagram. So speed of light uh, goes about maybe that far and back, over and back, um, in a clock cycle for two gigahertz. And uh, that's, you know, that's nice. You know, chips are only this big, right? So that should be okay, right? <laughs> well, the problem is that speed of light in a vacuum. How many, people, how many people's computers have, uh, contain vacuum tubes? Yeah, okay, um, no. Uh, and the other thing is, is that we're not talking about light, we're talking electrons. And, and the best you can say about electrons is it might make 30% of the speed of light going down a wire. But, you know, you have to have these inconvenient things called transistors, buffers, caches, and all this other stuff in between time, and those are like silicon, not wires. And there, if you're lucky, you might be doing 3% of the speed of light, which is pretty fast if you're trying to keep up with it running, but, but it's pretty slow for these computers. And uh, so you can see that, you know, it's going to take a while for stuff to propagate back and forth between those CPUs across that thing. And uh, going back to Michael's thing, we can, we can name these things, right? You know, we can, we can give these CPUs names, you know, like Carl, Tom, and Fred, right? <laughs> And so you know, these changes are kind of propagating out through the system, and so Carl and Tom and Fred have a different idea of which variable they are because the changes are kind of sweeping across the system in waves. And yeah, we can make things perfectly consistent um, if we didn't mind having everything be perfectly slow because we're going to have to wait for all these stupid electrons to make it one side of the chip to the other all the time. So this is why we have these uh, weak memory operations, and, and remember we're consumed being my favorite example of it, although... Not everybody's favorite, apparently. Hopefully, we, we're fixing that last part a little bit. So, just to, this is a hash tape, or excuse me, a binary search tree. Um, I presented this last year. That's the lower one. I since improved it um, in uh, January 2015. Got a little bit better performance out of it uh, by doing a little bit of tuning on it. So, you can see, what, you know, this is super linear. Um, don't worry about that. It happens sometimes. 60 CPUs, about 90x. Um, but uh, we are actually getting some reasonable performance out of this thing, reasonable scalability. Uh, at the same time, this is a search tree. That's not necessarily your best choice for a parallel algorithm. I mean, you have the stupid root node, which is a bottleneck, and that's usually a bad thing. So if you're doing concurrent data structures, a hash table is usually your first choice, although trees can be useful. You have to be really careful about how you implement them. And memory order consume helps because if you have everybody piling through the root node, if they're doing it without touching memory, they go faster. If they don't actually modify the root node, they're getting locks on it, not your reference on it, they just go plowing through it. They can actually go fast while they're doing that, which is why we're getting that kind of speed up. But a hash table would be about three, three times faster. Okay? Just depends on what you're doing. Uh, updates slow things down a little bit, um, and actually 3% of the operation are full tree scans, which really slows it up. Uh, but uh, as you can see, we get reasonably good speed up as we add CPUs. Not perfect, but reasonably good. Uh, this is a very toy RC implementation, but with full speed readers. It's about 20 lines of code, five of which might turn into memory order consumer someday. And uh, people still insist that RCU is complicated. I'm not sure why. Uh, this is the hash table again, showing a number of different things. RCU hazard pointers are almost as fast. They have some other things. Bucket locking does pretty well until you get off socket and then it falls off a cliff. Global locking, we expect it to be bad, and it is. Uh, but hazard pointers and RCUs do quite well in this environment. And RCU, again, likes memory order consume. Now, uh, this speed uh, comes at a price. Uh, and this comes back to the iron triangle that Michael talked about earlier. What we're doing here is we're getting reasonable productivity. Um, in the Linux kernel, people who are used to RCU use it quite well and quite quickly. We have really good performance, as you saw. We give up generality. If you're doing something where it's read mostly and you can put up with the fact that different readers at the same time might have different ideas about what's in the data structure, which is okay, surprisingly often, strange though it may be, 
Um, RSG works really, really well. That's just great. If you need consistency, it requires a little more mechanism. You have to add low-level locks in various places, but it still works pretty well, and that is used in Linux kernel. If you're starting to write a lot, well, there are parts of the Linux kernel that still get good speedups that way, but they're more complicated, they're harder, and uh, they don't get quite as good of speedups as you do if you're using RCU for exactly what it's intended for. If you're mostly doing updates, you probably want to use something else. Uh, there are a couple exceptions. One of them is where you're using RCU as a poor man's garbage collector. And the other one is if you have real-time constraints on the readers, even though they don't happen very often, they need to happen really fast. In that case, RCU still might be useful in an update mostly thing. But again, if you're mostly doing updates, you probably use something else. So on the Iron Triangle, we're getting the performance, we're getting the productivity, we're giving up generality. Um, it's used a fair amount in Linux kernel. Back in 2002, late 2002, when it first went in, I was hoping that someday RCU would be as successful in Linux kernel as it was in Dynamics PTX in the 90s before that. In other words, it might have 100 uses eventually. As you can see, I was somewhat pessimistic. We passed through 10,000 earlier this year. This, by the way, is not my work. This is the community's work. This is showing the power of a community that knows how to make things happen. And uh, I'm proud and humbled to be associated with the Linux kernel community. They do amazing things. Not perfect. Um, a lot of you guys probably know that better than I do. But uh, this is their work. So why do we want to use RCU? How is it helping? We get fast and scalable readers is the big thing. Free is a very good price, it's something I identify with uh, pretty heavily, and nothing is faster than doing nothing. And we've had a number of cases where we got orders of magnitude speed up by applying RCU um, in real code, in the kernel and elsewhere. Uh, it also avoids many forms of deadlock. The first ever use of, we didn't call it RCU back then, uh, back in Dynamics PTX, was mostly about software engineering, not about speed. Applying RCU in a distributed lock manager allowed my co-inventor of RCU to throw 16,000 lines of really horrible, grotesque, parallel code on the floor, along with all the bugs it had. So the, th the thing is, the readers don't win anybody, so they can't deadlock, um, and that's actually kind of useful. Also, none of, those, none of those APIs retry. You say RC read lock, you're there. You say synchronize RC, you wait, you come back. There's none of this, oh, sorry, try me again later stuff. And that means we aren't as prone to live locks as other synchronization primitives might be. Um, and uh, these are also well suited to real time programming. It also eliminates the ABA storage reuse problem. Um, and this is part of, the, part of acting like a poor man's garbage collector. Um, that's a topic that could take a talk in itself. Um, and the nice thing is it also plays really well with other synchronization primitives. If you want to, you can be in a RC read side critical section and acquire a lock. Or you can atomically increment something, or you do a compare and swap. It's compatible with them and you can use it, you can use combinations of the different primitives in order to get something that works well across the range of read mostly to update mostly. And there's a number, uh, the path name translation in the Linux kernel is probably the most impressive in many ways uh, example of having multiple synchronization primitives, including RCU, working together nicely. Okay, so um, I'm not gonna go through the readers too much. Uh, you, you, it's what you'd expect if you saw it there. Um, the key point here is that you can have this do something with function, and the dependency chain goes into it. So we picked up RCU reference, which is the memory order consume thing. We put in a pointer P, and we pass that pointer into this other function and the programmer is going to kind of expect that the dependency chain goes into that function with it. And he also expects that if we call that function multiple times in multiple different read side critical sections, all the dependency chains go in all the various places and go into that function where they need to. Um, so there's kind of fan in, it also needs to cross compilation unit boundaries. And uh, we also have fan out. There's a number of places where there's some function that's called that does an RC do reference among other things. This is kind of a, I don't know why you would do that, but this is a, toy example showing that. You call some function, it does an RCD reference, hands you back the pointer. The uh, dependency chain needs to come out through the return of that function for this to work, and does in the Linux kernel. Um, for updaters, we wait for a grace period, like you would expect looking at that uh, second diagram we showed with the red, yellow, and green. So we acquire a lock, we pick up the old pointer, 
We assign the new pointer to it, which we presumably allocated and, and filled in before this. We release the lock. We do a synchronized RCU to wait for all the old readers. Once all the old readers are done, we can just k-free the thing because nobody's looking at it anymore. Um, I'll talk a little bit about kill dependency. Um, I mentioned before that RCU plays nicely with other synchronization mechanisms. And so what oftentimes you'll do is, uh, in this case, we go to RC read lock, we pick up a pointer, and then we say, ooh, we're gonna have to hold onto this pointer for a very long time. Maybe we're in the networking stack and we say, oops, we gotta like, send something over to some of the machine and wait for the response. And we don't wanna have a reset critical section going over that whole thing. So what we do is, if that happens, we increment a reference count. And at that point, we don't do this Linux kernel at this moment, but we might do a kill dependency um, in order to flag the fact that, that there are no dependencies going through that variable anymore. We don't need them, we've got the reference count. Okay? And so that's a, the kill dependency is a way of indicating that we've handed off from the, I'm sorry? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Okay, great. So, uh, I'm sorry, I thought I had an hour. I obviously was, was confused. This is the current standard. Um, I've learned things about people hating dependency chains. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through and show the resolutions. <laughs> um, always make sure you know how much time you have. Uh, yes. Um, and uh, we have, what we're suggesting is ways of doing it without annotations that basically restrict the user to what the compilers normally do. Um, and that means you don't do things like, uh, like cancel out the pointer, subtract a pointer from itself, end up with zero, because the compiler will just say, hey, here's a zero, and break your dependency for you, so you rely on the fact that happens and allow for that to happen. And then uh, uh, that's something that's useful for something like a Linux kernel. It may not be nice longer term because it requires a developer to be keeping track of what the compiler is doing. So longer term, um, I'm thinking in terms of a storage class, type of a thing. I've had a couple of people say they like it. Um, unfortunately, those people were people involved with the original proposal, so uh, who knows. But the idea is to mark the variables that carry dependencies. So the compiler knows, oh, this variable has a dependency, therefore I have to be careful. And it also documents for the developer saying, oh yeah, okay, here's all dependencies, here they go in, here they come out, and everything's nice. Um, that's the interactions. Um, we don't have time for double check lock, but they'll be there. Maybe we have a happy ending, I don't know. Um, but uh, my hope is that we can use the restricted dependency chains, essentially documenting what optimizations compiler use for kernel code and other pre-existing large code bases, and use a storage class for new projects, and possibly also migrate the old projects to it. Anyway, apologize for running over. Would you be willing to take questions outside? Sure. Okay. All right, and uh, apologies to the next session. Thank you. Thank you.